Chris Bellarat of HobbyGameDev.com, and today I'll be giving a quick crash course on how to use Unity to quickly and easily make small, simple games, Unity games that are like this. Uh, I'm assuming you have no background in using machines, uh, and it looks like this is married to having built a simple car drive sim. I want to point out that even though the focus of today's tutorial is a car driving game, a lot of the same kind of techniques, both the flight methods and general navigation of the Unity tool will really map to any game in any genre, whether you're doing action games, uh, platformer, flight simulator, whatever it might be, even a puzzle game. So to begin with, let's show you the Unity builder. Let's first try to get this thing started. So for that, I'm going to go to hobbygamedev.com slash unity slash simple car. And you can see here we have our little car that drives around the environment, walks off the hill, we build out the edge, we climb to the middle. Uh, it's got a few extra features on here, so it has tilt the car, uh, press the button to do orienting, and also these different camera controllers. So it has a jump over third person camera, and it has a jump over a foot camera or a third camera follow me car. Form in the first person view, take it up the back. And an isometric camera, so it can actually follow the situation quickly. And then quadruple P will be flying the car off to whatever it is. Okay, so let's see how this thing came together. It's on the unitytv.com, Unity Simple website, and downloaded this week. Uh, it is free to use, uh, and you know, if, if you want to pay more, there are additional features you can get. But the, the free version really is uh, covering all that we'll need in how to create the game. So when you download it, you'll open Unity, uh, and you'll need to create a new project. So let's go to File, New Project. And within the associated new project here will Simple Car HDD. So I'll just click Do This or Hobby Game Dev. And then, of course, the car is going to come with you with that. We don't need any of these uh, import packages, but if you want these special bonus features, you can see those. So we're ready to create project. So we have a new empty scene, and we need to get our game started. Now I want to encourage you, if you're not already, to be using a two button mouse. If you have a two button mouse, plug it in. Uh, it is very, very useful on a Mac. Don't try to do it with a, with a one button trackpad. Just using Unity in general with a trackpad is not going to go as well. You, you're not going to have a good time. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is let's build a car out of sand. So let's go over in the world to Game Object, Create Other, uh, Cube. So let's hover over Cube Basic Camera Navigation. Or you can hold down the middle mouse button with the mouse wheel and drag and drop into the sand. And if you hold down uh, Alt and left click and drag, you can orbit. Perhaps most importantly if you're uh, still being oriented in space and you have an object selected, you can press F to swirl the mouse over the viewport and it'll turn your view on your object. So okay, I'm, I'm way over here, I'm kind of lost. One of my higher ups asked me to do this cube that I made. I can double click it and it zooms. Or if it's already selected, now I swirl the viewport and press F key and it will zoom in on it uh, the second time I click. So now to build this cube into a car, where we'll add some interesting flight design, have the car and its game happen and influence the overall Unity style. Let's use a transform. And it'll become the body of the car. I duplicated it by clicking it on the hierarchy. And then I'll use Command-D, Control-V if you really hate Unity. Uh, or you can go to Edit Duplicate. Right now it's the second one. And I'll drag that up. And then I'll click the top of the car. other and we'll use a cylinder for the tires on the car. Now to rotate, uh, we could use this gizmo to rotate it by hand. There was even a way to rotate it with the mouse. But instead, because I want it to adjust to 92, I'm going to type in 90 and then I'm going to command V on it. And it's fine with that. It doesn't have to like that reverse direction like the wheels. Let's make it a bit smaller. Tires 
one of our kind of youth leaders, youth leaders, and he took a guy named Earl and they began moving around against that officer, so they went to the back. So they they had a simple call and they they called the police. And we now need to know how these uh, under a single officer. So to make it easier to manipulate the call as as a whole team. So the way that you go about creating kind of a folder concept in Unity is to create a empty game object. The game object is created at the end of the menu. And this will be our parent name for the call. So we're going to name this to call all. And then we click and drag each of these pieces that we just made into call all. So now in addition to manipulating each of these parts, we can move drag them and drag, call all, do that, and move it all into one. Make the ground, make the, make a new cube for that game object, create other cubes, move it below the car, make it ground below the car. The scale, you can do anything you want. I'm going to make mine 20 by 1 by 20, just giving it the simplest object and scale value. Move it down there. So when we hit play, our we have kind of a weird view of the scene, right? We've got this silhouette, this kind of really pleasing view, and I know that the car's not fake, but they're they view from life, and so to solve that problem, we're going to add a light, game object, create a directional light, which we're going to adhere. And because we have a point light, we have a spotlight, or an area light, we need a number of them to properly light a scene. Directional light will come in at some light, so it comes in at one, and that will light everything. Uh, we can create view away from the car. The position in space actually doesn't matter uh, with this orientation. So you can go use those arrows to, to drag it away from the car. Uh, you notice our mouse over keeps going like up, but it doesn't matter. Uh, if you are zoom in, you will be doing UV's rotation gradient up here to start calling the car gauge. Keeping the light, so we can get a little better view of the car shape there. Uh, but our camera view still looks really good before we hit the car. So what we're going to do now is uh, click on the car, mouse over viewport, click up, and zoom back out. And kind of since we never move the viewport usually, position the viewport like you would like your game to look, which can be down there in the position center. We almost never go from down there. Then we're going to click on main camera go to the game object align with view. And what this does is it takes our viewport and sets up the main camera to match the position of the location. So now when we hit play, we see that our camera will have kind of turned to the view that we expected uh, based on the way we set up our viewport. You will notice, by the way, that when I, whenever I press play, mine turns a city of green. Yours probably isn't. Yours probably turns a, a shade of gray. Uh, this is actually a pretty important thing to know about uh, and we'll show you how to set it up. Uh, the reason why we why I make mine every green, I encourage people to make it pink or blue or whatever you need, is that while you're in this mode, you can still modify values in the editor. And the risk is that while you're doing this, this starts to touch it. If you want to move a character into the room or out of the room or move a wall, whatever, these changes get lost. And what's even more confusing is to press pause, because then you're back in your normal editor. You can still make changes anything you want to do, but as soon as you press play again, you know, uh, go back out and snap to editing, you lose all those changes that you made while you were in play mode. And so it's important to be able to tell very easily whether or not you're in play mode so you don't make changes and then lose things. So if you do have any real Unity preferences, this will be in a slightly different location on Windows, but you know, you can find it. And then your preferences play mode change is an important thing. By default, it's just a different shade of gray. I don't think it's a severe enough difference to something ugly and eye catching that would be very obvious to you when you're in play mode. Okay, so we have a directional light, we have a camera position, uh, we've got our play mode change changed. Uh, we've got a car under a car. And so now let's make our car have some gravity. So to do that, we're going to select car all, we're going to go to components, physics, rigid body. 
And this will add widget body here in the inspector for callout into our heart. And if we use that, we accept. So when we press start, you'll see the car drop a little bit. Press start. Pretty quick. Just to test, let's let's check our ground speed by instead of current speed, let's rename this to inspector. Let's hit enter key. And now I'm going to rename speed to ground. Uh, no, let's rotate the ground. Give it an angle. Just so we can see when we press start that gravity is not taking care of the car. So let me get a better view. Go into super. Press start. And yeah, there we go. Okay, so gravity clearly is working for our automobile. Let me start again. Go back to zero. Drop down to ground. Uh, let's give the car some headlights. Uh, let's, since we're placed uh, directly out to the scene, we want to give the car uh, spotlights. So first let's zoom in on the car, so no one cars by that we can't spot. And go to zoom out to create other spotlights. So point light is like the round light that everyone's familiar with. So spotlight is directed where we want it, for the car's headlights. And you can see initially it starts pointing down, and using the rotate signal, Click the number W, E, and L, which you can use, by the way, to break the mirror. W to move, E to rotate, L to switch. And again, I'm rotating all in the circle, so it gives better control over the lights. Give it that angle. And I can see here that roughly what I want is distance close to zero, and we can go to numbers real fast. So press start and change the head. Designate W to come up here and adjust the position of our headlight to C. I'm going to move the spotlight inside the car out so that it will move when the car does. And then I'm duplicating the move range to the opposite side of the car. And now when I press start, the headlight here is now lit up. And I'm going to move them a bit more so it makes the car adjust those headlights. Use the rotation signal to point them down a little bit more. And now that we much more clearly can press play, boom, there's the car's headlights. Now currently the ground is in the same state as everything else. I'm going to take a step through the car. Let's create a new material. So for that we're going to go to the assets field, material. We want this to name it. We name it Jack. And if you ever need to rename something, you rename it the same way you do in Rocket League. Just hit Grand Mod. That means click on it and then wait. Or you can al alternatively press delete and then rename it. Uh, if you're on Windows, I believe F2 will do the same. And all we're going to change for the ground is to set its main color by clicking on this white box. We'll change it to kind of a, a grassy green. And now we need to assign this material from our project onto the ground. So we're going to actually drag it directly here onto any object we want to assign it to. In our case, ground. And when we click on ground, now we'll see material appears under here. It is worth pointing out that this material is a shared resource, so if we assign a track to more than one object and we change it to any of them, it will change the grass color or material properties for all objects. Now the next thing we want to do is we want to make the car drivable. So let's go to Assets, Create, C Sharp Shift. Uh, we want to say that JavaScript, Buoy, Shift, and C Sharp Shift can all be used to do entirely the exact same thing. I encourage C Sharp Shift. If nothing else, because in C Sharp, it's a little better at keeping the action read versus capitalization error, which with JavaScript is more difficult to work. So instead of movie pages shift, let's name this car driver. Okay? Now the first thing we're going to do is going to assign car driver shift to car eye. So we haven't even written the car driver shift yet, but we want to assign it so that we don't write the shift and everything is broken because it's not written. So to do it, I'm going to drag it from project here onto the hierarchy on top of car all. And under the inspector, you'll see my bar here got longer. You see the car driver shift here from car all selected in the hierarchy. Now let's double click on the car driver shift to open it in modern develop. And you can see from the default comments and default functions up front, shift called only of the shift implementation and update is called every shift. Let's add this code and see what this function. Diff input dot diff key key code 
about seven years ago. And transform that position, help people transform that forward. And that's when I asked, how long is that younger child? It would look kind of complicated. Uh, you get used to some of this. It's not really a simple enough in between. If statement is something that if the two button W is held down this way and it will fire every flame, but the Q is held down, then it will add to the current position the forward vector from the direction our vehicle is facing since the vehicle is prone, it will still make it move the direction of the headlights and brakes are down. Times five is a sort of royal setting of speed for now, just so everyone will know this works. Uh, we'll make this number change with in a minute. And time delta time is necessary because the upper function is called every frame, and depending on a machine's persistent spec, the frame rate may be much higher or much lower. And by multiplying by the amount of time that passes between frames like this, we get a consistent speed in pending frame rate. So we're going to save the script, Control F or Command F, to bring in the OS, and we're going to try it. We're going to say, not on Crest Avenue, or I guess we're going to try saying it backwards, because it doesn't look like it's good. Yeah, the lights. And I should have known this was this was a VF, which uh, is pointing this direction. Slow down shift is just like never going to bring it back to full cycle. Control Alt or Shift. And we're going to rotate the lights back into spec. There we go. And now we press play. Sure enough, W does inhale forward. Just making sure we can turn the car. Let's play a new if statement. If input dot get to equals dot a. From here we're going to transform dot rotate vehicle gear up. We'll get the ABC image. AS and time dot delta time. Vehicle gear up. Something else I'd like to point out uh, is that transform is implied to be the position, location, and scale data of the object that we've assigned the script to. So if we did, uh, if we had a reference to some other game object, we could do that reference dot transform and get the position, location, and scale of that object. You don't specify a game object, then it just games against the the one that we assigned the script to, or in this case, car all. We're going to copy and paste the frame code over to the B key, and remove the negative. And with this, what this is doing is it's calling a rotate function, and then just the same function spec and rotation. And rotate, uh, there's many ways you can call the rotate function. The one I'm using here, we give it the angle to turn along each axis, and we want to rotate it to zero along the x-axis. Uh, 80 degrees to the left in this case is the negative, and the y-axis, which is the one that goes up and down here, again times delta time to accommodate for a variable frame rate, and gear point gear up along the z-axis, which is the angle that you want to roll. And if we press this now, we save the script, press play, and the car should now rotate and drive. I'm going to reverse that, we can have that in a moment. And you can, of course, you can drive it on vehicle world if you so choose. This is now reversed. It's a reverse simple change. We're going to duplicate the code that we have for moving forward onto the F key. And we're going to subtract instead of add uh, that movement amount. And let's throw something in between the x's and the Q's so that we can do the backwards as well rather than the forward as opposed to forward as opposed to CD. I will say that there is a, a more robust way to handle input that allows the user to enact the C code. So uh, you know, you could also use the AO or the use voice if they don't have. That won't be covered here, but I will show that example of that in the final version that we've uh, just evaluated at the end. So again, let's save that, press play, and we can now drive the car around, hitting reverse, and take off vehicle world. You might be wondering, how do I know those those things that I'm doing inside the script? How do I know those exist? Unity actually has a great script reference. 
unitytv.com slash support slash documentation with reference index.html. And it should have uh, guides uh, that this provides all kinds of helpful information about what what you can and can't do in Git. Uh, more examples of this in the uh, Steve Browser docs. But we just have these numbers floating around, like 5 and 2 and negative 80. What we're going to do is we're going to make this be modifiable for our car. Here inside of our class for car driver, our car driver script, we're going to add public float forward speed of 510 RF. And we'll see there is a backward speed of 2.0 RF and turn rate is equal to 80. So we have three public float variables. Each, each x has to be 0 as part of the float, it's the relation to the float as opposed to the double string value. And down here we're going to associate these, these numbers we have with the variables, forward speed and backward speed. I'm auto-completing, by the way, that we just had this, so that I can keep going. I'm going to grab what I already had, turn rate, and turn rate. Okay, so all we've done is we've made three public variables and we've placed where they were in the code down here, saved the script, and now if we click on car all in the editor and scroll down in the inspector, you'll see that three of these numbers are exposed, forward speed, backward speed, and turn rate, and it inferred those names based on how it camel closed to these variable names. See I called it turn rate with a capital R, so it knew that turn rate was the word. And we can change these numbers here, so if we make car drive forward uh, much faster, we'll change it five percent. And room now is, is so much faster that I won't change it again. We want to make it move much slower. Change that number. And set it down to like five. So it's like this is a really powerful way to make it so you can create an object and then change it inside the editor um, on a per case basis. Or for example, if the program on your team wants to set it something that way in that tuning, I'm going to have a designer on the team worry about how to get the project uh, these results or different things moving in a fair and sort of usable manner. You know, Grant's been uh, sort of speaking it that we are manipulating a car's position directly by changing its transform position. Because it is a rigid body, another way that we could move the object is to apply physical forces to it. And that works a bit differently. Uh, instead of update, we would use the function shift update. And instead of transform switching, the curve, we would instead do something that looks like rigid body dot add force effective uh, transform dot forward. And this would apply a forward force to the car of a certain magnitude. Uh, this has a certain type of gameplay that it leads to. I find it sluggish. Um, of course, if we're for games that are physics based, it's important to see force and conditions arise for certain reasons. Also note that I did this in shift update. The difference between shift update and update is that shift update is called a known number of times every second, unlike update, which is just a frame rate decimal. And so it's important to use shift update for any code that does physical manipulation of the rigid body or, or the approach or other methods. We were able to use rigid body there for transform because it implies that it's the rigid body assigned to the game object shift force. Now let's add a sphere, some more curve. We're going to go to game object, create other sphere. So there's a sphere here. Let's make this uh, change the size of them. We'll do four zero point seven four to make a short, flat curve. Make it five point half way underground. And then half to half again back to the place that we were doing the from. Let's now let's just leave it white. Uh, let's try gliding over it. And we will initially encounter that it is it is going to flip your car. Uh, it's very, very oddly tall for how big it looks. And see, the reason for that is because by default, a sphere uses spherical collision, which is why we see this big sphere around it. That's what the car is hitting. Uh, so there's a faster calculation. I can do a collision for a kilogram distance. What we really want is uh, to determine, is this mesh collider? 
and then if you're the parent, you're the school official, so that's kind of getting ready. And tell us that it's not collateral. Uh, tell us that we're close because it's saying we already have a field trial with this. And now it will use the nest data, the polygons of our of our states, instead of assuming it's a school, but to locate it. And so now we have a much more modest bump with car to ride over. And that makes very smooth driving going over the hill. While we're here, show them the fine graphs of the hill so things run a little better. Just to create a, a better system for our camera, one way to do this, sort of a, a very easy, I might say lazy way to do it, uh, we just click on the vehicle and move our camera, move our viewport around to where we'd like it to be for a third person camera. And then we'll click on main camera and do the same for a community. It has no objects aligned with view, but it's a camera where our view is. And then it'll stay there. But if we can make a child of call car all, then it will move along as the car does. So now it's still the third person. But this is like an extremely rigid camera. Uh, this isn't very nice. It's not very smooth. We don't have as much control over uh, sort of making it latch between the car or, or any effects like that. So let's move the camera back by car all. And we'll say take control of the camera with a stick. So go to assets, create, restart stick, and we'll call this car cam. So I'll click this car cam, go into our system model. Uh, we are going to create two new variables. Public camera view camera. Public camera or slash asset. And then inside the update function, we're going to tell use camera to transform the look at track at. And now the way this is being set up, we can specify any camera uh, to track any object, and it will constantly point this bar to have that option. We could have the object assume that what we've assigned it to is the camera or is the object to be tracked. Uh, instead, we've written this configuration swamp and out. Carl used to show how to make this connection inside the editor through various ways. And this will also, by centralizing it in this fashion, make it easier for us to change the way that the camera can be uh, switched between if we want to have multiple cameras supported. So select the editor. You'll see now we have our car cam script, but it's not really assigned to anything. It doesn't really matter what it's assigned to. It's assigned to our car just for some reason. And now when we scroll down here, see our car cam wants to know which camera to track which object. And there's two ways to do this. The one that I like is to drag here from the hierarchy main camera onto where it says view camera, and it fills in that slot. So we have the camera information from that object. Now for track object, it wants to transform, and I could drag car all onto it. Instead, I'm going to click on this slot's next to it, which gives me a list of everything it has a chance for, all the things that I could have dragged onto it, and I can select car all, go to click that, and it fills in with a chance for next car all. So now when I drive around, the camera's constantly following the car. Kind of a, a magical touch. Going through the window and through the window and through the side of it. There's other ways to control the camera, uh, switch between camera modes. I'll include the source for that in the final version, but I'm not going to show you here. Let's add more hills though. So I'm going to duplicate the hill, I'm going to control D. I also want to show that just like there's this green arrow we can drag up and down with, there's a green square which allows us to drag it perpendicular to that axis. In some case of our hills, it would be a really handy way to keep them flush to the ground while we change their dimensions. So we can have some sort of you know, some bigger hills, some smaller hills, some longer hills. Maybe we can do to those two right there. There's n really no harm in them overlapping. Uh, I'll have to show you what the uh, Oh, the car is off of there. Again, and we can still drive. Don't let's do that one another way. 
um, but we want to give the car away to the Orient Express when it gets built. It's kind of like the Warthog for Halo. Before we do it, let's just do a little bit of cleanup. We have these gears floating around. Let's call those pigtails. Get my stuff back here. And we'll fill this thing up. Uh, and we have here the ground objects. Let's make some children of the ground objects just to keep them organized. There. Inside of our, our car driver strip, we want to add a new key to reorient the car. Let's make that the X key. You know, it's going to look a lot like the previous one, so we can copy and paste. So, press that. Except now instead of get key, we're going to use get the car. We're going to use get key back. And the difference here is that whereas get key triggers every frame that the key is held, get key down only does it for the first frame that the key has been pressed. Because we don't want to do this constantly, because then it's going to work when the key is being pressed. We're going to do several things to the car when the X key is pressed. Transform that position. That should work. That's the three dot X. This will lift the car one unit off the ground. We're using vector three dot X because it's an objective X vector. If we add in said transform dot X, it would be up from relative to the car. So if the car is on its side, this could be, you know, east or west, depending on where the car is rolled over, or it could even be down if the car is upside down. But by adding vector three dot X, it's an objective X vector. It will always be away from the ground. Going to do rigid body dot velocity equals vector three dot zero, and this will stop movement of the car. So if there's any little tumbling, it will stop its lateral movement. And related to the tumbling is we're going to set the angular velocity to vector three dot zero, so to prevent it from rolling. Uh, otherwise, when we reorient, it will just keep having that roll component. And then lastly, we're going to do one that's going to be a little fancier looking. Transform.rotation equals quaternion.lookRotation transform.forward vector3.x. Uh, I broke down here just for my low resolution editor that I'm using for the, for the camera capture. Um, you don't have to worry about breaking down all those again with audio and that. Transform forward is telling it the direction to maintain for the way the car should be pointed. Vector3.x is telling it which vector to make upright. Uh, and so this is going to make our car um, sit upright. Otherwise, all we'd be doing would be bumping the meter into the air and derailing its spin to make movement. So this is the part that really does make all the setting the rules work. So let's retry it now. We'll press play. And we'll flip the car over. Press X, pop. We can see the car is upright again. So if I press up the car and I press X, boink, and then it's good again. Now, quaternions are kind of a complicated subject. They're important because otherwise, there are problems that emerge from using the offset control, um, something called gimbal loss, which we won't go through. The thing about quaternions, though, is, is even though they're very complicated from a math perspective, as a programmer for Unity, we don't actually have to understand them so much as we have to know what it is that we can do with them. And so for that, we can actually just look at the item tree for quaternion. And you'll see there's all kinds of interesting things to read in the documentation about how to use. Uh, but they're very powerful, very handy, and as long as you know what functions to call, it's actually not the end of the world if, if you have the kind of documentation that knows exactly how to do those things and say, hey, take it. Look it up and say, look, make some notes. Now, if the car falls off the edge of the world, that's still a problem. We can upright the car if it slips. If the car grounds off the edge of the world, it's just done. Um, there's no saving it. You can just keep tapping the upright button, and you can still drive in the air. But let's pretend like that never happened, because you know that, that's silly. We can fix that um, the day when we have more time. So instead, let's make it so that if the car goes below a certain point, it will respawn at a, at a given location. So let's create two new public variables. Each of them is transformed because we want it positioned. Our lowest ground object, this is the indication of when the car has gone too low. And the other public transform will be respawn position. This will be where we'll set the car when we cause it to go too low. Let's do this as our update to share each frame, how this has happened. If the car is transformed, positioned vertically, or uh, Y, 
is less than the lowest bound object to the first bound object. Dot y. Then we want to set transform the hard position to respawn position to the right. Now doing what this is makes sense. It's again kind of wonky if you haven't gotten used to it yet. But we're comparing the y position of our tile to the y position of the ground object we're going to feed it. And if we were below it, we're going to set the hard position to match the position of our respawn point. Uh, that does mean that now in the editor, in the tar all, our script does want two more references. Uh, it wants the lowest bound object to be assigned and it wants respawn position. Lowest bound object is just simply the ground. We'll drag ground right to it. Go to scale and that, that position. That way we could also click on this thing if we wanted it to respawn for us. Now respawn position we don't have yet. So let's create one. Uh, all we need for that is position in space. So we'll go to game object create entry which gives us our x coordinate with rotation but no other data associated with it. And let's just set it over here just for just for an example so we know where you know it's in it's a very particular spot so we can figure out where this thing is. Um, it's not necessarily where the car start is, but it's but you know it's a space position. We'll call that respawn spot and then whatever we like it's it's still organized. And now for tar all we will assign respawn spot to respawn position. And if we test our script, there we go. Spots going up towards the world, and we'll just go back out to the entry. And so you can see there that Atari is, is keeping the tumble from when it goes up towards the world. Uh, another way that we can fix that, or I guess the simplest way, is if we also set transform.rotation to the respawn position rotation. And now it doesn't matter that the car was up to down or fell, it will be the orientation of the respawn position. You'll see this thing spinning. But for that, we could borrow code if we wanted from the uh, button to stop the car spinning and so on. Um, not terribly important to worry about, but if you want to keep that thing fresh, it's a, it's a more stable respawn system. And now what if we want the car to respawn exactly where the car started? I think that's a sensible expectation to, to play with. Why not put the respawn spot exactly on top of the car? And there's a very easy way to do this in Unity. Where the position coordinates of the transform are relative to a parent. So if we make respawn spot temporarily a child of tar all, and then we zero out its transform data, it will center it on the car. And we can also zero out its rotation to make this the same orientation as, as we, we already are. But now we'll make respawn spot no longer a child of car, so it won't lose any car dev, and it recollects the transform data to be world coordinates. So now, uh, when we respawn, we're respawning in exactly the same position as our car started in. And that's just the handiest thing in Unity to, to center one, one object's coordinates and orientation on the car. Let's create a speed chart of, of a speed of crash thing here. And for that, we're going to go game object, create other, make it out of cylinder, it makes sense to me. You can see by default the cylinder isn't very tall. Let's make it taller, I don't know if that's tall. Make it round, yeah, that's kind of a good height. Make it a little bit skinnier. Probably so too. Make a sort of a practice of getting a new material, asset to its material, color instead of white. Um, sequence, make them brown. I accidentally forgot to name it, so it chose new material. So then I'm going to be enter on a Mac, F2 on Windows. So we'll name that the speed chart color. And then drag that onto the speed chart. And then we need uh, we need a top of the tree. For that I'm going to where did where did this go? Game object, create other sphere. make that grass color because we're working off the tree. And what kind of a little green? There we go. Oh no, we should have done that there. Now we could make trunk a child of treetop or treetop a child of trunk to stay organized. 
what I recommend instead is to create a completely new Zen logic tree empty. Let's call this full tree. And we're going to make both the treetop and the trunk tiled with full tree. The reason for this is this allows us to keep the scale of the parent one, one, one. If you make either one of these scaled objects or tiled with the other, scale can get messy when you start to do rotation of children and so on. Uh, so that's a sort of create a simply unique alternative to folders and empty folder loops. So we have a tree now, and uh, sure enough, we crash into it, which we always do. Bump. But let's make it so when you crash into the tree, it respawns the car. And so the first thing we'll need to do for that is create a new tree start script. Create tree start script. Asset create tree start script. We're going to name that uh, reset then crash. And then inside this script, Uh, we're not going to write any code for a starter update. Instead, we are going to write a query function called on collision enter. So that's one argument, collision, the collision. And this is code that gets called whenever a rigid body collision occurs. Car driver, other object, other object script equals the collision dot game object dot get component uh, car driver parentheses semicolon I realize this is a this is kind of a, a, a uh, we'll walk through in a second how this works but it's there and then if other object script is not a sigma null we're going to call other object script dot respawn now let's go back to the car driver. Let's get rid of that script. We're going to create a public function called respawn uh, in which, let's actually, so here we have code already for how to respond and update, so we're going to go below the earth. Let's just change that to a called loop function and move that code or copy and paste it in from down there up to respawn. So now if it falls to the edge of the earth, it will respawn the car, meaning it will execute this code for the car. But also if we crash into the tree, because this function is public, we can count on the other object that collided with it. And this is a really powerful way in Unity, a powerful thing to be able to do in Unity, to get a script on the other object. So this is checking that the other object that I have a collision with has the tree. Uh, does it have the car driver script attached? And if it does, we can call the respawn function on that object. Now we're not quite at the earth, unfortunately. Because if we, if we try this now, well, so first of all, we have an attached script. So, so let's go to our full tree. Let's attach reset and crash. But again, we're actually we're not going to have any results yet. And this can be frustrating for new to the Unity of, of why doesn't it respawn me now? And the reason is the tree has to be a rigid body. Like I said, on collision enter is an event drain when rigid bodies collide. Uh, but the tree is not. So let's create a component physics rigid body. And so now we can collide with the tree, and the car should respawn, and it does. Um, I will say, though, that, uh, oh, our tree fell over. Uh, that's a problem. The way we need to avoid that is to tell it that this tree uh, is kinematic. We're going to check like it. Uh, that's actually the same, I believe, as setting its length or depending on all six of these to fit locks, we'll do for the same rotation. And this just tells us, don't let physics probe move this object. We just want to use this to detect collisions and things like that. And so now we'll collide with the tree. It reset. It respawns us in the same way that if the car were driving off the edge, so goes the tree, and it does. Next up, we're going to cover briefly the prefab system, which is a powerful way in Unity to create uh, sort of an exemplar object in a modification plane. So let's go to Assets, Create Prefab. Obviously, we're going to name the prefab. I'm going to name it prefab because I think that's outstanding. Uh, now we're going to drag full tree, the parent object, onto the prefab. And now here's the here's the magic. We can drag prefab onto the ground, all over the place. So it trees around, and each one of these is already hooked up the same way as our first tree with a rigid body and with the scripts attached and so on. Uh, 
know that when a car drives around and yells at them, it gets a response every minute. And it's even more interesting, so you see that each has their own position, so the position data here is in bold. You can make changes to these, so I can make the scale of y to 3 fob, and pop on this one, which make it uh, bigger. And then let's make it to 10 taller, thicker. Massive tree over here, and they're all still axis bound. You see, there's a huge tree. They respawn quick. They take our lower bigger top tree is, and you can take those changes, which you can see are you know highlighted in bold, and we can either be like, you know what, I didn't mean to make the tree so big. I want the tree exactly the way my default tree fob is. If we click on reverse, it will take it back to the properties of our of our common tree fob object here in the project. Or if we made changes to one, like let's say I had turret, and this actually happened in previous Palo Alto. I had turret, and I made one of them display a little bit better by adjusting its pruning parameters, and I wanted all the turrets like that. So let's say that we decided this tree was the color we were going for. We'll click on that one tree, and here in the tree fab options, instead of reverse, if we click apply, it will make all the, all the tree fabs have set to the settings that were bold, except for this one. Uh, and we'll take on those, those connections as far as our sky is gray, which is kind of kind of an asterisk in the air, which is kind of a bluish. But we want to have control over our sky. And so let's create a new material. And we'll name that sky color. And the color can blue, can light here to uh, whatever shade of blue you like. There we go. There's, there's a blue for the sky. Um, let's go to edit uh, render settings. This is where we can set sky box. This is also where you could set up fog if we wanted it. And we're going to drag sky color onto sky box material. And you'll see there it instantly filled in. And now we have the color of our sky. Uh, you could use cube maps and other fancy things for this. I won't know what that would do. Uh, just give you some control over making everything go to one place at a time. And again, fog, if you want to set that on, will control the value you know, more than local. Uh, let's also add text. This is a very useful thing to suggest. Game object, root other, GUI text. And it's going to, by default, appear in the middle of your screen. Let's set its position to 0, the left side, 1, which is the top 0. And the reason why that that shows the edges is because the anchor is set to the upper left. We could change this to make it appear in the other corner, which we we can't do. And now let's set the text for it. I'm going to say car sample from Unity. Let's just make an alt enter by the scale of y. And the alt enter is the way that I go to the next line. It may be different in Windows, but it's probably some key combination of enter to the new line that you're seeing in Microsoft. And so now when we play the game, those words appear there. So it's a good way to set it to the to say get get the update and say that that's brand new in the line. Or it's a value struct. You can go whatever your whatever your game needs might be. And just like any other object, you can connect this up to code to to read out some additional data uh, and so on. So if you want to go from car to other script, say you want uh, Hover, GUI text, debug output. And we're going to hook up our text object to this. And with our update, let's say that we, we really strained with knowing uh, the car's X position for whatever reason. So we're going to send a set to debug output here in this here in this line. Um, empty string request, whatever, we'll make a string out of it trivially. Uh, so we're going to set the text property of our GUI text to the X position of the car. And then don't forget under car all that we have to hook up debug output to our GUI text object. So I'm going to add the data to our debug output. I'm going to create car all for that hidden in structure. And now as I drive around, you can see that value. And so this, of course, is a handy way to provide arbitrary compress uh, or even spatially relevant data as you're working on debugging features of your game. Let's make it a slightly bigger screen. Uh, one last thing that we also need to account for is we need to find code that we know will always be running. In our case, the car driver seems pretty safe. But we can be careful of that if, if the car got removed from the universe or it exploded, this code will no longer run. We need to put the, what I'm about to show you in code that will always be running. And for this program, we know it's Unity. 
that's the input that you get to decode that mistake. So if the user presses the escape key, then we're going to do application dot fix. This will not show up in the web version. This will not work inside the Unity editor, but this is absolutely essential if you are doing a local Windows or Macintosh build. So if someone can fix a game without having to consult the Unit 4 splitter. Um, it's, it's a little insane here because this isn't built into the program, but uh, you know, uh, developers be warned, add this to your program, it, it will save you trouble. And so this is essential. Again, let's go through, there's a nothing here, but when we export the program now, we can use the escape key fix. And so this is where we can escape key now is just for making a build. So let's go to file, uh, build settings, and we can set the Unity size. Here we can tell it we want a Mac OS X build. We can click build, and it'll put whatever speed we want to put it. I like to create a, a, a folder called deploy inside my project and save all my outputs there. Tar Mac OS X. Get it. Um, it'll take a second to output that the project information. And it'll show us the version. And I can now run that. So I, by default, that's me choosing my properties. Click on it. Click on the first screen. Save my game. Click log on. I can rerun the tar. It all seems to work. Everything still works. The user still built the OpenC file, pressed the save. Still didn't get the bug checked out for me. And let's click escape. It'll close that since we added that input code. Uh, you can also output the PC, the Windows build, even on Mac. Again, that's just pretty much build table. Our PC uh, is definitely a, not a nice thing to see in the zone of me. Take it a moment. And there's a lot of things you can do. You can output the web player. Uh, all these, of course, are free. Uh, with Unity, you have to pay for the other output options. Uh, so we'll worry about those for now. Uh, deploy. Tar web. And when you output the web, it'll give you an HTML file uh, with the file already embedded. Tar Unity, tar HTML. And so this is actually all that I had to do to output the sample build that I showed at the start of this uh, walkthrough was outputting the build this way and placing that HTML file into the web. And again, as I said, the escape key is in the lower part of the screen. And I hope you've had a good time installing this tutorial. Um, I know it's not beautiful, but hopefully it's enough to get some people started uh, exploring Unity and all the great things you can do with it. If you've got questions, please let me know. I'd be happy to answer them. I might do a follow-up video showing Shine and various other kind of stuff, camera techniques, uh, and everything. So if you want the full source code, check it out. It's going to be on the blog entry at hobbygamedev.com. Thanks again. Have a good time with it. Bye-bye.